Okay, good morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today in this wet Saturday afternoon. Um, I, do you all know Ricky Armendariz, uh, his work? Or, uh, I don't know if I need to make a big introduction. Um, but Ricky was born in El Paso, born and raised in El Paso, came to San Antonio first to study at the University of Texas here in San Antonio, and then proceeded to go to do his MFA in Denver, Colorado. So the idea here is just a kind of a conversation. I'm happy to please go ahead and interrupt. The, the idea is to just have a dialogue, have a talk. Uh, please bring any questions. Just uh, the idea is just to kind of communicate, get to know more about Ricky's work. And so this is, uh, this is really exciting. We have been doing a, we also have a catalog and he can sign it for you in case you want to purchase. Uh, he has a wonderful essay and a very nice bibliography that as our historians worked, worked a little hard to let, get it completed. Uh, so let's start. Uh, Ricky, would you like to, to share with us a little bit about, um, you want to start maybe with borderline themes, uh, how the narrative of La Frontera influenced your work, uh, and, 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 and Rick is such a pleasure because he has a, an incredible way to narrate themes, uh, so I mean you can just talk and talk and talk. <laughs> um, Patricia is, is referring to uh, Las Oteot as a horse, um, this uh, diptych to my left. It, is the oldest work um, in this exhibit. It started um, a number of years ago, um, dovetailing into a, a previous exhibition that I had done. Um, I'm from El Paso, uh, a border uh, city that borders uh, the US, uh, Mexico, um, and also my place of residence also bordered on New Mexico. So it was um, an interesting uh, childhood lots of different cultural um, themes and references um, throughout my, my young childhood. I actually thought that that was kind of ubiquitous for everybody. And ha had I not lived in other places, I wouldn't realize how rich that culture was when I was actually physically in it, had I not gotten out. But at the time, uh, border issues, uh, surveillance, uh, the closing of borders, um, my family literally bisected by current politics, it, it, it's constantly on my mind. And I used to get back to El Paso once a month. I've since um, you know, shifted it to probably about once every three months now. But I, I, I'm constantly uh, looking at the El Paso Times and looking at um, uh, issues that are relate to border and border politics. Um, Plaza de Oc is a um, Mother Earth um, midwife deity for the Mexica, the Mexican Indian people. Uh, Tlazoteot is represented by a black mouth. Um, she takes and ingests the filth so that mothers can give birth clean. And so I thought it would be interesting to depict her as a horse. I have been using animal iconography for a really long time and I sort of feel like if you, you still, if, if one uses imagery that is referential of, of uh, Mexican pre-Columbian iconography, one has to do something new with it. And so by using the surrogate of the horse, I'm attempting to make something contemporary about that same subject matter. Um, I turned her into, uh, in, in essence, uh, a sin eater. Um, Catholics know what I'm talking about when, when I talk about sin eating. Uh, there's an a the actual sort of um, sect of individuals who, that's their job. They ingest the sins for uh, sinners. And um, it's a way for individuals to pass through purgatory and into the gates of heaven. And I was always, I was raised Catholic, and I was always very interested in that um, absolution of, uh, of sins um, you know that people can do later in life and so here the horse sort of ingests the drones and the helicopters and the various other kinds of uh, explosions to for us sinners I guess and uh, for the border and border uh, politics 
So that's where it all started. Um, the idea of belly, in the belly of the beast, it was kind of rattling around in my head when I made that work. I started picking up on a lot of my drawing that I was doing at the time that referenced things inside of things. Kind of like those Russianistic dolls that you have um, as a kid. And I was always fascinated how, how that is a culture, well, that, that theme makes its appearance a lot in a lot of different uh, narratives and stories. And so it doesn't belong to any one culture, that, that notion of things inside of things. Um, it's present in um, Zeus's devouring, or excuse me, uh, Saturn devouring his children, Goya's uh, famous black paintings. It's present in um, the Bible with Jonah and the whale. So it's, it's the kind of theme that maybe uh, crosses cultures. It's the kind of universal theme that crosses cultures. And so being interested in that and coming to it, I think, rather intuitively, but, but maybe not so intuitively because I'm influenced by culture and cultural uh, uh, themes permeate us in our mind without us knowing really, I think, on a lot of different levels. And so that led me, uh, or coincided with my uh, Berlin residency. I went there, I made a print with a bear inside of a whale. I was explaining, if you purchase a catalog, there's a, a mini synopsis of the story that I created um, to explain how the bear finds its way into the whale and how the bear escapes. Um, and that, you know, led me into being really, really interested in mythology, not only my own personal mythology and native people's mythology, but the mythologies that are present everywhere. In Berlin, Europeans, from my perspective, live with their um, mythology. They, it's all around them. It's ubiquitous. It's in the facades of the buildings, it's in their language, it's in their stories. And they, um, how can I say, they, it's, it's, it's so in, ingrained in their aesthetics that I think they sort of don't see it anymore. It's, it's, it's like so much beautiful scenery that you just sort of don't see it anymore. Um, often you'll see images of uh, nymphs and Saturn and uh, uh, satyrs, you know, in the facades of the buildings. You'll have Atlas holding up the archway where you drive in to get into a building. You have um, mermaids and, uh, and various other sea creatures dispensing water on the corners. And it's, it's like everywhere. So I, I was just, rather than sort of appropriating that, I thought like I could use both a little bit of these characters that find their way into mythology both in my culture but they're also in other people's mythologies as well. I did that for a little bit. I was interested in the spoken word and language. That has always been an interest of mine with the text and the song lyrics that make their way into some of the paintings and into the prints. It also um, led me to kind of investigate <coughs> poetry and the formality of poetry, like haiku poems. And these are double um, Spanglish haiku poems that are on flanking this large painting that are behind me. Um, there's a haiku poem that's behind you that is actually an appropriated um, Bob Dylan lyric that I turned into with a little finessing into a haiku poem. Um, so all of that I thought was like incredibly <coughs> interesting. Um, Oftentimes I use animal imagery because it relates both to my culture, but it's also something I think that's very user-friendly uh, for viewers. They're able to, to enter the work um, the same way the aesthetics and the colors allow the viewer to enter the work. So, do you have any questions? When you say your culture, what's your culture? Well, uh, I'm of Mexican descent, but my grandfather was Rara Muri, uh, Indian, um, Mexican Indian. Uh, uh, people call them the Tarumara, the runners. Okay. That's what I get from this whole exhibition, is that side of the culture, yeah. especially the Indian culture. You know, it, it's, it's interesting that 
it, it's, it's a strong influence in a lot of different ways. And it, it's, it's, it's an influence both from the aesthetic point of view, but it's also my, my grandfather, uh, Bricio was his name. He, he wasn't a nice man. He was actually rather abusive to my grandmother. And the conflicts that they had, they loved each other so much, but they could not live with each other at all. And, um, and really, when I sat down and, and talked to Patricia and various other people about this exhibition, the whole exhibition revolves around power dynamics, uh, power found within uh, your household, um, power that is cultural, uh, power um, that, in fact, even the title, uh, In the Belly of the Beast, comes from, and I didn't know this when I picked it, but I investigated and found out later that the title is actually a title for a book that Jack Abbott wrote. Okay. He was a person who... Norman Mailer's project. Right. Yeah. Norman Mailer. Yeah. And Norman Mailer, Norman Mailer got him out of jail. Uh, his book went uh, to the top of the charts, and it was a sensation. And then, it took, you know, you probably know how that all turned out, but it, but it would, you know, he was not a nice guy. And so I really, I, I love like, I love the, the power dynamics that are found in the text, in the volatileness of the imagery. And all of that is like, I love you so much, but I, but I can't live with you. And these are, are you know, my, my wife thinks that all of this work is about her. <laughs> um, but, but really, you know, I mean, maybe it has something to do with her, but I think it has a lot to do with the, the examples of relationships that I grew up with and that I understood as a small child and that now I see through and with adult eyes and I'm able to kind of see the similarities and dissimilar, dissimilarness of, of my wife and I's relationship. Well, it kind of depends on the subject. <laughs> yeah. Now, Rick, Ricky, I see uh, the incorporation of cosmology a little bit on your work, especially with the painting behind, right, right here in front of me. Uh, this unique inclusion of the stars, and of course it has your beautiful whale and octopus, a lot of the sea life that you have incorporated for a long time. But uh, I see those that cosmology, and also in in, the, in another painting that we have here in the back. Is that kind of the where you are going? Is your next step the incorporation of more of stars and the cosmos in your paintings? Is that you know that, that's always been. Um, uh, a, a cursory influence of mine, um, the same way that my uh, spiritual practice has always been sort of a cursory uh, influence on my work. Mm -hmm. I I investigate that, and I, I try to, because I w once it becomes part of your paintings, I think as an artist, you you really have to kind of pay attention to that. You may not have mm -hmm. uh, c had full control of it when it entered your work, but once it's in your work, then I think as an artist you have to be, in a sense, take, take responsibility for what the work is saying, regardless of what you intended the work to say. And I think that there's a lot of uh, subject matter like that, that I'm always kind of uh, investigating on a lot of different levels, and I think that I, I will continue with the narratives and the stories, I will tell you that there's plans for paintings that that are large moons, you know, um, with animal uh, associations sort of in them. You know, um, everybody knows that you know the rabbit or the idea of the rabbit being in the moon is uh, pre-Columbian in, in nature. Um, but you know, again, like pre columbians didn't own the rabbit or Tochtli, you know, they, they don't own it, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm really interested in remixing um, those mythologies. Yeah. So yes, and you know, uh, Zeus makes, uh, you know, a, a, a the presence, cover. yeah, the cover, the cover of, the of, the, of, the of the book. Um, you know, this, this directly comes from, um, you know, my, my time in therapy, basically. <laughs> You know, and, and the therapist being really, really interested in, um, in, in dream um, therapy and dream um, decoding, I guess. And we, we talked about how 
in art history how Zeus is always being depicted as, as this animal or that animal, but oftentimes as a bull. And I thought it would be, it's sort of humorous to think of Zeus being incredibly narcissistic and sort of dreaming about himself. And if he dreams about himself, is it two bulls sort of fighting? And is one a good bull and one a bad bull? And, and, and you know, I, I love, I, and, and my therapist at the time, I have a different therapist now, but she was like, you know, you realize, Ricky, that, that all aspects of the dream are you. And I was like, no, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this, you know? She's like, no, really, like even the most difficult thing is you, just manifested in a different way. And so that kind of got under my skin and I started thinking about that and that starts to enter the work a little bit. And so, you know, I, I think it's fascinating how, you know, as an academic, I, I really did push off all of that personal stuff for such a long time and now it seems to be uh, making its way in without a whole lot of forcing. Mm -hmm. Well, because, it, you know, I, I, I see it as a metaphor. I see it as a metaphor that we sometimes, our, our, our worst enemies, we're fighting ourselves sometimes. And it has to come through and to be, instead of being our worst enemy, it will be our worst friend, best friend. I mean, <laughs> so I see that in sales, for example, that I can, Probably you have another reading. I mean, a lot of people have different readings, and that's, that's the beauty of, of, of good artwork, when it has this, all these different meanings for different people. So tell us a little bit about the text influence on your work. Is that you, you grew up in a rich family that used to narrate, that used to talk a lot. Your brother is a poet. Tell my father, us. yeah, my father was a, a he, he's, was a singer. He cut a few records when he was my age, um, and he was constantly singing in the household. So, and, and we didn't we didn't have well, we got a TV later, but we, we didn't have a TV for a, a good period of my life. We we weren't allowed to to listen to certain stations on the radio. We were only allowed to listen to to what I call old music, and so, so <laughs> it was a lot of like you know Buddy Holly and. Uh, uh, Billy Holiday and um, uh, Freddie Fender and Hank Williams and these kind of, these cats, you know. Uh, and my father was always singing. And my mother, and this is my father's rule. Don't get mad at me. My mother wasn't allowed to sing to us because her, her she didn't sing one. <laughs> and my and my father like really paid attention to that, you know, because he was afraid that we weren't going to grow up or with a with a tone deaf ear. <laughs> and so. And, and so we, you know, so the meaning, I guess, uh, not just the melodies, but the meaning of songs became really important to me as a kid. And, and I remember hearing for the first time, hearing Freddie Fender singing both in English and Spanish. And I was like, that's it. That's like, that's me. That's me. That I, I get that. that. That speaks to my experience being on a border where we seamlessly move from English to Spanish and back again, or sometimes with both. And, and I thought, oh, and also, you know, when I, when I was a teenager, there was this great station that played um, contemporary uh, uh, US hits, but in Spanish. And so you would hear songs like, uh, you would hear like a, a, a Van Halen song, like, and you would hear a singer who sounded like David Lee Roth, but he was singing, you know, corren con diablo, you know, and it was like, and it was like hilarious. And, and, and I thought like, again, like, wow, this is, you know, this is so much code switching that, that it, it, it makes sense, you know, it makes a weird kind of sense. And so I, you know, having a brothers and my father was a, an English major, you know, and my brother was an English major, you know, novels and poetry was always around us and so I literally became interested in music lyrics as poetry. I gravitated toward like Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen and uh, and these guys who who if you take their music, their music really started first like poems and then they put melodies to them and then and then I started going into popular music and finding if you took something out of context, it became poetry. You know, if you took uh, a lyric from a band, an 80s band like Poison, 
and, he, and you, you took the lyric, uh, every rose has a thorn just like every night has a dawn. This is like really, this is very profound. And yet in the original context, it's very cheesy. You know, it's, it's campy. It's, it's something that's easily dismissed. I had a friend uh, who, uh, you know, younger uh, adults, young kids, teenagers, he would rap uh, the raven. Yes. You know? And they would just be so enthralled. They just like thought, yeah, I'm so original, I was great. But it was, you know, the raven. Yeah. And so uh, something like that. Exactly. Like about. Yeah. And, and, and finding the profundity, is that a word? Profundity in, in, uh, in, in these lyrics, I thought, oh, that, that's wonderful. Like, I don't know if anybody's doing this. I go, but th this is wonderful. And then I became, I became really interested in, because um, I couldn't find visual artists doing it. You know, I saw a lot of, of musicians doing stuff like this, but I couldn't find any visual artists that were, were doing this kind of thing. Lots of artists were using text, uh, you know, uh, Ruscha, Baldessari, all these cats, right? But Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg, yeah, a I little think, bit, yeah. Yeah, I think he, he opened Exactly. For me, yeah. You know, when, I, when I saw what he was doing with all that, you know. Um, you know well, he definitely. He was sampling way back. Correct. Where they even had that term. Yeah, exactly. And and a lot of them were using humor. And again, I thought like, okay, well, that's this is great. Like, I can do this. You know, this this makes you can talk about super serious subjects, super difficult subjects through humor, and and really make some headroom you know, really be able to convey an idea. So yeah, like that, as, at an early age, I was very, very hyper aware of that. You know, my, I often joke that like indigenous people are like the most sarcastic people on the planet. Cause like, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a way of coping. You know, it's a way of dealing with heartache. It's a way of dealing with, with illness. It's a way of dealing with all these things. And it's, it's, it, it's unlike any other, um, it's unlike any way, it, it, for me, it's, it's the best way to deal with these really, really tough subjects. I think maybe um, everything that you said sort of points, points to language, and you know, of course you deal with text, but I think language is so important, I mean, it just drives everything. I mean, look what it's done to our political system. Yeah, you know, the, the, the language that they use, and so uh, I think that's the, you know the power. If you can control the language, then I mean, of course, it's not an emotion; it's just not emotional. So many people have written about that, but you know, <coughs> so language I think is the, the key. Yeah. Narrative, you know, myths. Yeah, myths I think are an attribute of culture. I think everything that you said is about culture. And, you know, the acceleration that culture happens these days, you know, you just have to, you have to do it quick and fast and sometimes just to keep up, to keep it relevant. So that's, I think that's the challenge, you know, for our artists these days. Mm -hmm. And so why not bring in every, every, in everything, you know, why not be something that's causing the heart Yeah. I mean, it's a full circle for me. I mean, you mentioned your background. For me, it's like, Moroccan, you know, Iberian, Mesoamerican, you know, Mexican, Texan, and now American. That's six, you know, so hmm, globalization is taking me right back. <laughs> so it's interesting. I mean, it's a real challenge, not only just to keep your shit together every day, but just to, you know, make art as well. Yeah, <laughs> and, and make something that, that in, a, in a sense, comments on and builds on the things that have been made before. I mean, I think that that's like a, a super big challenge. Well, it's a postmodernist you know, yeah. notion. I mean, there's, there's no originality. I mean, it's originality is impossible. So and this is what you have exactly. to do. Exactly, and that's why do the sample. for years I've been um, rereading all of those books that were uh, required reading in high school and in college and mining them again and finding new and inventive things that inform my present state now. You know, I'm, I'm, and now I'm, I'm into rereading the book and instead of collecting them the way I used to um, and, and treating them like revered objects, I'm rereading them 
and putting them on free tables. I'm giving them to students and telling them to read these because I think that like I've had my time with them. Like I've read them 20 years ago and I've reread them now and now it's, <laughs> they need to go to somebody else because like, like Jesse said, it, life is so fast right now. And I think what the book does is it causes somebody to slow down. Now I'm, I'm dyslexic and now I'm, 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 a, I'm a really fast reader. I can ingest a book probably in a weekend, uh, the kind of books that I read, and, or a week at the, at the very at the outside. And I, I, I'm on a mission to, to reread everything that every professor has ever asked me to read. And I think I'm getting a lot out of it, a lot of different things from it. And, and my new thing is to pass that on because I don't know if they're gonna get it. Maybe they'll, they'll have a trajectory like I have, but eventually perhaps they'll, they'll get it. And it's certainly not informing anybody on my shelf. <laughs> so, so it's like, I, I really feel sort of dedicated. My wife is like wondering why I'm taking all of these books. I mean, cause you know, it's an aesthetic, right? It becomes an aesthetic. But it's like all the books are going away, or at least my books. Do you think? Do you think they're reading? I hope they are. I really do. I'm I'm giving them to young professors, and read. I'm giving them to faculty. I'm giving them to anybody who will listen to young people. Don't read. You know, they're I, unable to read more than a page or two. I, I've been teaching I'm hopeful. fifty years. I'm hopeful. And the past eight to ten years have been enormous. I don't even teach English. Yeah. Well, that's part of the acceleration. Well, it is. Comic books. Well, I mean, there are lots of them. Many of the students are reading. The good students. Oh, the good students is... And that's, our, and that's part of our job, one to, try, to, the good so, to try to make them read. <laughs> it takes discipline. Well, it, does. it, takes discipline. it is. So it's like exercise. It's, it's literally interesting what like you're saying <laughs> is making the word prime have a primacy in the culture, and our culture is destroying the primacy of the word through commercial or through repetition, I mean, yeah. or through Goebbels thing, if you say it over and over long But like time. Jesse says, if you can get artists interested in classics like The Raven, and they, right. they, they reinterpret that uh, same text and the same conversation through a different medium, then it's, it's a way in. And, th and that's what I talk to them about a lot. You know, my students right now in Painting 2 are doing an assignment that relates to um, uh, the road, uh, McCarthy, uh, Cormac McCarthy's road, the road, um, and it, it's basically they have they're putting everything that they would want in a post-apocalyptic world in a box, and it's a still life, okay? And it's everything. It's like everything that they would want, and that's all they get. They get this box, and that's it. And these portraits, they're literally like self-portraits, are are fascinating. Are really fascinating. And I'm talking to him about this book. I'm talking to him about the relevancy of Cormac McCarthy as an artist, a contemporary artist. I'm talking to them about this being uh, an odyssey of, of sorts, the book itself. Um, and that, you know, how they can take something personal and make it contemporary. Can you put uh, the books that you've been reading, you put Martin Lane in there? Have you written them? No. You know. And you're passing them on, and like, if, even if things are just underlined, if yeah. there's a conversation, not between just you and the, the writer, right. but between you know, depending, the yeah, you know, I think that that's fascinating. Depending on the day, I feel like like a like a page turner or not a page turner or a writer or not a writer, you know, in a book. Um, I think that sometimes the books that I've gotten that have been written on, they're they're kind of distracting, and and. Um, you know, I, I read, uh, in fact, a series of, of Hemingway books that I got um, recently from a used bookstore. Were, I know they came from the same person because they were all written like on, like the same way. And, and I, I found myself having a conversation with this person like this person didn't pay attention to the important things, you know, and, and, found, and found like, um, you know, it, it just made like sort of frivolous points, you know, and, and it was and it, and it, it, it was just it was just funny, you know, like like having a conversation like that, you know. So. Now, when you went to Berlin, tell us more about your experience there. To be three months away from your work, from your family, and total 
I loved it. Uh, it, it, it no, I don't want to say reclusion, <laughs> but uh, without so many distractions of your daily life here in San Antonio, and how did you come out with the theme of the why the whale and why that size? Uh, that is, it's about this size. This, this whale here is a remix of the one that he did in, in Berlin. And why a woodcut? I mean, why not a painting, for example? Right. Did you think about those things? I did, and th there's a kind of a lot of practical reasons. When I went to Berlin, I thought, okay, I can't, I, I can't see myself making large paintings out of wood because it's going to cost like a million bucks to get them back. <laughs> like, when, once it's over there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really hard and difficult for me to physically get them back and expensive. So I thought, okay, I'm doing this wood, I'm doing these printmaking thing. Maybe I can do, I can find a printmaking studio up there that can print as large as I need to. And sure enough, I found Tabor Press um, in Berlin, uh, and they print as large as anybody can print anywhere in the world. Okay, and um, without a steamroll. Okay, yes. um, a conventional press, and they were very um, happy to work with me on the fly. They had worked with. Uh, you know, what's his name, Jonathan Meese and various other like really big um, European artists, okay? And, uh, and I thought, wow, I feel like, like I'm working with Heron the Hound who works with Art Pace and all the, the wonderful artists like uh, Jesse Amato who have had the privilege of being an Art Pace resident there. And, um, and I thought, wow, th this, is, this is what I need to do. And I, I literally thought, you know, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make these prints, and I'm gonna cancel the block. I'm gonna destroy the block and bring home the prints, and that's what I did. Like I, I made these blocks. I spent months and months making these blocks. They're very intricate. I printed them five prints each, and then we destroyed the blocks and brought and brought I brought the work home in a tube. It was easy for me to kind of use as a, one of my baggers. Uh, but the imagery, I mean, was an extension of the animal stuff, the iconography that I was used to. To, to working with, but I was using it in a different and kind of inventive way. I became, again, sort of mesmerized by the mythology that, that Europeans live with, specifically Berlin, uh, the Germans there, and all the transplants uh, that Berlin has. It, Berlin is a multicultural place, and all of my um, assumptions of Germans went completely out the window when I uh, went there for three months. Uh, all the people who are brown there, who look like me, are Turkish, all of them. And it's funny, it's, it's fascinating, because they, they recreate a lot like Latinos do. Um, they get, um, they, a lot of their cultural habits are a lot like Latinos. Um, I'll just give you one example. Um, they go to parks very early in the morning. They stake out their location. They <laughs> lay down blankets. They uh, grill all day long. Uh, the women and the men have their respective duties. The, the children run around half naked. Uh, they play their music very loud. And they are a family. They go there and they enjoy each other's company. And they stay there all day long. And Berliners are sun worshipers. They literally go out whenever the sun is out to take advantage of the sun, because the sun doesn't come out very often, okay? And so they're there early in the morning to late at night, every time they can possibly do it. And if they have means, they leave town when it gets cold. It, it's just, they're, they're the lovers of nature. Like, it's incredible. Some of the things that I went to there, not the art things, were some of the most interesting things that I, that I experienced when I was in Berlin. I literally lived like a Berliner while I was there. I, I, we lived in um, Kreuzberg. It's an area that's predominantly Turkish. And in like a, a two or three block radius, there was literally like 10 grocery stores, 10. And they all serviced a different need. Some had the good vegetables, some had the good meat, some had the good bread, some had alcohol where others didn't, some had beer and wine where others didn't, you know, and, and they serviced the community and all the different needs of that community. And by the time I left, I literally felt like I was a Berliner. I felt like I was, uh, belonged there. I could go into a store, I didn't speak Turkish, but I could point, they knew who I was, 
and they knew exactly what I wanted before I even asked. <laughs> and they were like, I mean, literally, it was like, it was so comfortable. The subway system, everything is, and the bus system is so efficient, it's ridiculous. You know, we traveled to London, we traveled to Paris, and nothing was more efficient than that in Berlin. Like, it was incredible. Um, so it was, it was a tremendous experience. I learned so much. And the power lines are underground. Yes. And so I, was, I had to defend the good of US of A when I was in Berlin. And like I told Ron, uh, someone said that we were, Americans were um, a third world country. Yeah. And it's because we still have power lines. Yeah. And, and it's true, I mean, two weeks later after I got back, and that, when I was in the Northeast, uh, there was an incredible wet snowstorm. And people were without, but and two million people were without sure. power because of that. You know, it was just too yeah. heavy for the power lines and it just broke down. And so, he was right. <laughs> Makes jobs. Yeah. We, have a, we, yeah. have a, we have 150 year old technology for our communications. Well, I think too, the, because those it's, wooden it's, poles. it's going to take 40 million to fix that as opposed to, you know, 4 billion to do a uh, infrastructure. Uh, well, what do you think it takes every time we have the power line? It's fascinating. I, I spoke uh, politics to the director at, at Kunsthaus Batania, the, the residency where I was at, Kunsthaus Batania, and um, he was telling me, you know, because he was into music, he was a musician, and, and he took me uh, to a show or two. Uh, by the way, um, Berlin, certain area of Kreuzberg, was the birth of punk music in Europe, okay? Like um, Sid Vicious and Iggy Pop and David Bowie and everybody were like, that's where they went when they were really, really young. And anyway, he, uh, he would talk to me about the politics of Berlin. And he said, like, he, he's like, do you realize that we are going to be without nuclear power in 2020? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, he's like, they unilaterally said, and both sides, both of the major parties agreed that they're going to be without uh, nuclear power. They're going to switch to, to wind and air and solar and all sorts of other things. Anything but nuclear power by 2020. And I was like, how can you get that happen? He's like, it was easy. He's like, that was a, a platform that the Green Party was championing. Okay? And rather than allow the Green Party to have any kind of, of movement or power, they just appropriated it. <laughs> The, 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 ruling, the ruling party, I forget which, which, I think the Democrats are the conservative ones over there. I, I, I think that the Democrats sort of uh, appropriated that issue in their platform, took it over, and passed it. And then the Green Party's out, right? And I was like, I was like, that is fascinating. He's like, you know, that's the way we are. He's like, you know, it, it, it's... It was, it was just really, really, oh, and you ask any Berliner, any Berliner, they are so knowledgeable about politics. You ask anybody on the street here, they would have a hard time talking about even their, their representative, you know, and who that representative is. There, they are fanatically interested in politics and the world around them. So to explain why all the power lines are underground is not hard to explain because they're rather forward thinking. Very they're, progressive. they're very progressive. Well, they lost it all. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it ebbs and flows. It ebbs and flows. But but I, I just use that as a point because it, it's fascinating. You know that kind of mentality. Was he absolutely convinced it would happen in that time? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It will happen. It will happen. For sure. At three o'clock in the morning. You know why? I know it'll happen. At three o'clock in the morning, in Berlin, if you're trying to cross the street. The Berliner is standing on the street corner waiting for the light to go. Mm. The tourist just crosses the street. There's not a car to be seen. And there's no cars. <laughs> They're waiting for their little green man to, to tell them to cross the street. Order, order, order. That's what's wrong with Order. Them. <laughs> Rules. Well, yes. it, 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 it binds the them. Yeah. It binds them and it uh, informs them. Exaggerated then, exaggerated. Uh, one could say it's exaggerated, but another could say, you know, that's why their, their public system is so, it is so uh, well run. I, I, 
well, it's because mm. when I was there and I went up to the window, I mean, went mm-hmm. up to the door of the car and I was just about to step on it and they closed it off. I was too late. Yeah, that's it. And I was right there, <laughs> you know, yeah, but thank you. they're very rigid about that. Well, so why don't we, why, since we have this uh, incredible work here behind us, why don't you tell us a little bit about the narrative and maybe we can, maybe if you can think about a couple of questions for Ricky. Uh, and then we can wrap it up. You know, I, I've always, in, in, with this painting concerned, um, a lot of the work actually in the show deals with kind of heavy subjects. And this one in particular is, is probably the heaviest. And it, it references Goya's um, painting Saturn devouring his children. Now, Saturn was always, like most rulers, sort of worried about losing power and worried about that power uh, being mis, um, misused by his offspring. And so the myth goes is that he literally ingested them. And uh, Goya made this painting wonderful, uh, Saturn devouring his children. It's very, very graphic. And it's even actually more graphic than the image that we know. Uh, you know, with technology, we were able to kind of find out actually what to scan it and to x-ray it and find the image under the image and it's and you can look it up and I won't ruin it for you because it's kind of a punchline you, you can look it up online and find out what the image is underneath Saturn devouring his children and it's it's, it's very very horrific and and so I am not one of these sort of blood and gore kind of artists I, I never have been but I really like talking about um, heavy subjects and so I thought it would be interesting especially because I've been sort of in an existential crisis myself, to, to portray myself or um, Saturn as an aging buffalo where his children are pestering him and beating on him, and sort of, and, but he has no will to kind of fight back. And, and, that, and that's the way I, I sort of wanted this image to be depicted, where Saturn is old and aging and he, he has no will to kind of resist uh, the, the, the influence of his children on him anymore. And, um, and so here you have uh, images of crows and uh, emperor moths. Um, emperor moths, I think, are interesting because I, I heard of the story where Darwin uh, prophesied that um, there was this animal on the Galapagos Islands that could feed um, or repollinate this particular pitcher plant um, that was on the Galapagos Island. But he died. 60 years later, they, they discovered this particular nocturnal moth, um, it, sphinx moths or emperor moths as they're called. And they have this really long proboscis that unfurls like a slinky and gets down to the nectar and is able to pollinate these, these, uh, these flowers. And it, it's fascinating because Darwin, you know, came up with all of these sketches or ideas about, you know, is it a lemur, is it an insect, is it this, that, that somehow, knowing what he knows about flowers, that they need to be pollinated, that he knew that there was something on this island that was pollinating these things. And so the name and the fact that, like, you know, he, you know, his sort of kind of uh, scientific mind, I, I really found that interesting as it related to uh, Saturn and, you know, royalty and, um, and, you know, it has sort of a royal name and that's why I sort of in- inserted it into the composition. Do you have any questions?